church family. It's a joy to be with you this morning. I uh, want to just briefly say a sincere word of thanks from your pastors. As this week, uh, we were presented with a very generous pastoral appreciation gift from you. Uh, just on behalf of us receiving that, we're humbled and very thankful for your, your loving kindness and your generosity towards us. So thank you. Uh, with that, would you join me now as we go before God in prayer? Let's pray together. Almighty Father, we come to you, the creator and owner of this universe. And we thank you that you have made us to enjoy you as our chief treasure. Father, we pray today for our country. And we thank you for those that have served for this country, both present and in the past. Father, we recognize that this country and the peace that we enjoy here is primarily because of your kindness to us. Father, we pray for our leaders and all those in positions of authority, that they would lead in such a way that we can live quiet and peaceful lives, as your word teaches Father, we pray for ourselves that we as Christians would be model citizens in this land, showing those around us what it means to be a good neighbor, to be charitable, to be generous with those that are unlike us. Father, we do pray today for our church. We have all different members from different stages of life in this congregation Father, today we especially pray for those who are retired in our midst. We pray, O oh God, that those of us who are younger would learn from and grow from our time with older members of this congregation that have more experience than we do. Father, we pray that you would be with uh, our retirees. Uh, Father, we think of saints like Gary Korn or Emmy Douglas, or Sharon Mishmi, or so many others come to mind. We pray that these saints would not buy the lie of this world, that their retirement means endless leisure, but rather that these saints would use their time and their prayer lives, and their affections, and their ability to encourage for your glory. Father, may our older brothers and sisters minister well to us, and may we receive it as they don't waste a single year of their retirement until you call them home. Father, as we come to your word today, we're confronted by what you say about money. And so it's fitting that we would pray for our wisdom even as we enter budget season. Father, we pray for our church, that we as a church would not lay up treasures for ourselves here on earth. Help us to spend on behalf of your glory. Father, with our budget, help us to be faithful, even when we have less than what we planned last year. May we be faithful with little, so that we would show ourselves to be trustworthy with much. Father, help us to trust you that whatever you provide for us is enough. Father, we ask that you would provide more for our church, that we could do more for your kingdom as a church. We pray that you would provide, Lord, as we think of future needs on the horizon, for an administrative assistant that's paid or a, a paid children's ministry coordinator, or other ways that we could serve more effectively. We pray, Father, that you would provide so that we could support missions work more as we ought. We pray that we could one day plant a church ourselves. Father, we pray that you would guard us in our use of your resources. Almighty God, far more than financial riches, we long today for spiritual riches in Christ. And so now we go to your word. 
which is more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold. Open our eyes to see today, O God, the surpassing worth of Jesus Christ as we look into your revelation. We pray this today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Empty promises can be surprisingly convincing. Uh, Just think of some examples in your life. I mean, perhaps words spoken by a lover promising the world, feeling so powerful. Or perhaps uh, you've overheard uh, assurances of a parent when trying to just console a child, making empty promises that just come off as so persuasive. Or guarantees made by a salesman who wants to make a sale, and yet, is, while being so compelling, is offering empty things. Or perhaps the most famous of all empty promises, a presidential candidate looking for your vote. Maybe you'll remember George Bush Sr. or studied him in history as he stood in the 1988 presidential national convention and he gave the famous promise, read my lips. He did well. His speech was so convincing. It was a powerful moment for his supporters. But although convincing, he ultimately wasn't able to keep his promise. And it hurt him. He did eventually raise taxes. Now, while empty promises are just everywhere across personal and political landscapes, perhaps none are more subtle and yet more convincing than the empty promises made by wealth and possessions. You see, wealth makes promises. And so materialism, the desire for for money and possessions, it's not foreign to any of us. There is not a person in this room who is free from the risk of greed. And yet how quickly we forget just how empty its promises are and how little it delivers on what it guarantees. Today, we return back to the book of Luke in our study through this book. And we come to a passage where Jesus teaches on the danger of wealth and particularly greed. If you haven't already, open your Bibles today to the book of Luke, chapter 12. We'll be studying verses 13 through 21. As Joe just read for us, Jesus here is exposing the nature of our hearts in relation to covetousness. You'll see that word there in verse 15. Uh, Covetousness in this passage is the desire to have more, to selfishly hold on to what you think is yours, irrespective of need. It's greed in our hearts. Now, as we work through this parable, I want you to just notice what's happening here in this story. Jesus isn't calling for obedience by sheer willpower. He's not saying, stop being greedy. Just be more generous. I mean, we often think of greed and generosity in these terms. Like, as if holding on to possessions that I have, well, that's good for me. But Jesus says I should be more generous So I guess I should try to do what I ought to do. But if you, as you listen today to the passage, notice that's not Jesus' approach here. He is making an argument from perspective. Jesus wants you to see that wealth makes empty promises and that greed, holding on to your possessions, makes you a fool. He wants to show us how it's actually foolish for you to hold on to what you have. Well, how will greed make you a fool? Let's unpack Jesus' argument together today. To explore it, we'll move through three movements in this passage. Number one, the tendency toward greed. Number two, the foolishness of greed. And number three, the solution to greed. I pray that as we look at Jesus' teaching, God would release you from any traces of greed that 
are still lodged in your heart. Let's consider first, number one, the tendency toward greed. We return to Jesus, and he's on the road to Jerusalem. As he's been traveling, he's been teaching his disciples about fearing God. And in this passage, a man calls out in the midst of his teaching. Look at it there in verse 13. We read, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? He said to them, take care. Be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So here we're introduced to this tendency toward greed. And our tendency, as we see in the text, is subtle and it's convincing. This Jewish man had a dispute over his family inheritance. Coming to a rabbi would have been a normal way to settle a dispute. So this question might seem innocuous, but not for Jesus. Notice the context of this chapter of Luke shows that the man, he just wasn't listening to all that Jesus was teaching. He's not teaching, he's not thinking about the, the future that Jesus had been teaching about. You remember this a couple of weeks ago, last time we were in the book of Luke. Jesus was talking about being short-sighted and, and not seen far off. Well, here, this man is consumed about earthly matters. And did you notice The man doesn't want Jesus to decide between two positions. Not really. No, he tells Jesus what to decide and what to say. Give me my share of the money. The concern might seem subtle enough, and yet it's clearly consuming this man's attention. So Jesus refuses. He's out for a bigger goal than merely to settle earthly disputes. No, he's here to introduce a whole new economy. That's when Jesus warns him. Uh, If this man wants financial advice, Jesus is about to give uh, some of the best insider trading information that we could possibly receive. He says, be on guard. Take care. Not against losing your inheritance. Not against identity theft. Take care against greed in your heart. This man's greed might seem subtle, but Jesus says, watch out. You know, uh, Timothy Keller is helpful here as he comments on this verse in his excellent book, Counterfeit Gods. He points out that we are often blinded by this subtle desire for more money or possessions. This is even evident here in the way that Jesus responds. Keller says this. When Jesus says, watch out, be on guard, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, that's a remarkable statement. Keller says, think of another traditional sin that the Bible warns against. Think of adultery. Jesus doesn't say, be careful you aren't committing adultery. He doesn't have to. When you're in bed with someone else's spouse, you know it. You don't say, oh, wait a minute, I I think this is adultery. You know it is, but not necessarily with greed. Yet even though it is clear that the world around us is, is filled with greed and materialism, almost no one thinks it's true of them. We are in denial. I think Keller's right. Jesus says, watch out. Be on guard. Christian, I wonder if you realize you need to search your heart for the empty promises of greed. Church, this sermon and this passage will just be so much more helpful to you if right now you begin by assuming that you have some measure of greed in your heart. So maybe just think of greed as less like an on-off switch and more like a dimmer switch in your heart. So it's not either on or off, you're a greedy person or you're not a greedy person. But perhaps it's more like a dimmer switch where where there are some misplaced desires that might not be as high and flagrant as others around you, but in your heart you realize there's still places where you're valuing materialism, the things of this world, more than you should. What is it for you? 
I mean, this will be so much more helpful if you just take a minute and maybe just think, where could there be a danger of this for me? I mean, is it your, your money, your house, your car, your, your dreams, your desires for a little bit more luxurious living? Jesus says, take care. Be on the lookout for the patterns of your heart. Oh, friends, take a moment even now to just pray silently that God would show you traces of greed in your heart. Notice also, by the way, that Jesus says, take care against all covetousness. Notice that word, all. It implies that there's different kinds or species or uh, degrees of misplaced desires for worldly possessions. Your covetousness might not look like someone else's. This would be such a great lunch conversation for you today. With a friend over lunch, you just talk about what types of covetousness can you think of in this world? How does it look different in different places? Maybe you can just talk with a friend. What is the variant of this virus that your heart is most susceptible to? Well, this tendency towards greed, it's not only subtle, but notice from the text, it's consuming. Notice how it's consuming this man in the crowd. He apparently wasn't hearing Jesus' teaching or coming to Jesus to learn about God. No, he came to Jesus for what he could get from Jesus. It seems that Jesus saw this. He warns him, and all those standing around, look at it, he says, one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. Friends, Jesus wouldn't warn us of this if there wasn't a risk that we could begin to think, even in a small way, that we find our life consisting of, our, our, our identity, our, our meaning consisting of our money and possessions. In the original, the, the language, by the way, is even more comprehensive. It literally says, you do not exist in your possessions. This is the empty promise of wealth. It gives you some sense of significance, doesn't it? I mean, haven't you just seen this in your life? Money and possessions, they, they, they promise to make you feel important, don't they? I, I, this is just the fact of this world. If you don't believe me, just, just think about the world around us. Why is it that if an extremely wealthy billionaire just walked in the room right now, we would be tempted to pay more attention to that person? Why is it that most of us would just be embarrassed to be seen wearing old and faded clothing? Why would uh, we be so often self-conscious to have people inside of our homes? Or why is it that we're so, it's so hard to drive around an old, beat-up, rusted-out car and not be a little bit embarrassed? Uh, maybe this isn't true of you, but I, my argument is that at least in part, this is true because money and possessions give a sense of significance. I'm not saying wealth is wrong. I'm saying we're naturally tempted to think in part that our lives are significant because of the money we have and the things we own. We're just tempted towards that. Well, Jesus gives us an example to expose how foolish this is. Look at number two, the, the foolishness of greed. The foolishness of greed. Follow along as I read from verses 16 and following. We read there, and he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger, larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, Jesus here uh, begins this parable with a farmer who had a good year of additional wealth just falling in his lap. His land produced plentifully. And notice this man is not wealthy because of evil means. Did you see that? He's not a cheat. He's earned what he has fairly. Jesus is intending us to relate to this man. Yet even though he gained his wealth honestly, this man clearly has an ownership problem. Did you notice the most repeated word in the parable? That's the second most, I think. We're getting there in a second. He says, my crops. 
my barns, my grain, my goods. Most significantly and scarily, verse 19, my soul. This man, like us, he views his wealth not as something that he is stewarding, but as something that he owns. He's the owner. He understands that what he has is his. Oh, but Christians, the Bible says so differently. Scripture makes clear that what we have, we have been entrusted as merely stewards to hold for just a few short years while we're here on this earth. I mean, this world and everything in it doesn't belong to us, but to our creator. And we are merely stewards of it. I wonder how you think about your house, perhaps when somebody's coming over, or how you think about your car when somebody nearly hits you, or how you think about your paycheck when it lands into your bank account each week. Notice that seeing himself as the owner, this man dialogued only with himself. This is what you just saw. It was his business alone to decide how to spend his money. This word I, it's so prevalent in the text. What shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. I will do this. I will tear down my barns. I will store all my grain. I will say to my soul. So as the owner, his own thinking dictated his plans for his money. Friends, do you view what God has given you as yours? How would you spend your money differently if you regularly reminded yourself that you are merely a steward of God's money? What if every time you got a paycheck, you just took 10 seconds, you paused over the check, you thanked God for it, and you asked him for wisdom for how to use his money in whatever way he would want you to use it? Well, this man, he wanted to hold on to what he had. He, he didn't actually believe. He didn't actually believe what the Bible says when it says it's more blessed to give than receive. So he built bigger barns to hold all of his wealth. He planned only for how he could save more for himself, endlessly improving his retirement is what he was doing. All extra proceeds going to the 401k. It's more important than looking for how he could use his wealth as a blessing for others. Now, by the way, I should note, the Bible has a lot to say, a lot of good things to say about saving and thinking of the future. I mean, just go and read Pro- the Proverbs. They're just full of encouragements for slowly putting away money with diligence for the future. You see, there's a God-honoring, others-serving way to save money. But there's also a limit before it becomes selfish. There's also a evil, selfish way to save money. A way that prioritizes keeping money for yourself. So when is it? When is it that saving turns from being just wise stewardship, of a, a wise aspect of your use of finances, to selfishly hoarding for you to use? What's the answer? I think the answer comes in verse 19. Uh, look down at verse 19. Let me, uh, let me read it first. He says, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Let me take a stab at this and see if you agree with what I said. One way that savings turns from wise stewardship to evil selfishness, get this, is when earthly pleasures become your ultimate end point. When your earthly pleasures become your ultimate end point. Do you see the logic of the text? Do you see where Jesus is headed? By the way, doesn't, aren't these words exactly what our culture is trying to tell us. Our culture spends billions of dollars trying to convince you to believe this. Spend only on yourself. 
Enjoy this life now on this earth. Work hard until retirement, and then check out. You've earned it. Or enjoy your college years. You're only young once. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Now, Jesus isn't condemning enjoying the good things of this life. No, he's condemning short-sighted hedonism. He's condemning living like this world and its earthly joys are your greatest treasure. He's condemning only spending on yourself without consideration for God, without consideration of others, without consideration of how you can glorify God with what he's given you. I wonder if you've ever heard the story of John Wesley. Wesley was a British pastor who lived in the 1700s. He believed that with increasing income, what should rise is not necessarily the Christian's standard of living, but certainly the standard of giving. His example is instructive. His biographer recounts that in, he actually became a, quite a famous pastor. He was quite well known, was successful as a pastor, helpful to many. His biographer recounts that in 1731, Wesley began to limit his expenses so that he would have more money to give away. He records that one year his income was 30 pounds, and his living expenses, he decided, were 28 pounds. So he had two pounds to give away. The next year, his income doubled, but he still lived on 28 pounds and gave 32 away. Uh, in the third year, his income jumped to 90 pounds, and again, he kept only 28 and gave the rest away. The fourth year, he made 120 pounds and still lived on 28 pounds, giving 92 pounds away. Get this. One year, his income was slightly over 1,400 pounds, just a massive amount in, in Britain in the 1700s. And he gave away all of it, save 32 pounds. What, his biographer writes this. It says, John Wesley was afraid. He was afraid of laying up treasures on earth. So the money went out as quickly as it came in. He reports that he never had as much as 100 pounds at any given time in his life. Now, th that's just a, a powerful example. I'm not saying that you have to do exactly what Wesley did. But I do wonder, has it ever occurred to you that God might give you more money so that you can steward it for causes which will bring more eternal joy for others and not just earthly joy for yourself? The man in this parable only thought of himself. Verse 20, we read, But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? You see, death is the great leveler. It's the immediate, overnight depreciation of all your values and assets. I mean, when you lie on your deathbed, the value of your earthly money and possessions will just disappear. I, I think of our family. We, we lived uh, for over a decade overseas in Egypt. Uh, when we received the, the call to come to First Boynton, uh, we began to get ready to come to the States. And immediately, when you all voted on me, and I found out that I was coming, immediately, I stopped withdrawing Egyptian pounds from the bank. Uh, we had a decade worth of a, of, a, of a home and furniture, a library of books, possessions, which quickly needed to be liquidated. The reality of our future plane ride shaped every purchase we made. We knew that we had 10 suitcases to fit our whole lives into. Now, how foolish would it have been for me to go out and buy myself a new living room set or additional books for my library? Anyone looking on would say, why are you withdrawing more Egyptian pounds? What a foolish investment. You can't take that with you. Friends, in a very real sense, this life is a visit to a foreign country 
with an infi infinitely important trip already scheduled at the end. And so here is the foolishness of greed. It's too many of us are busy withdrawing a foreign currency that we can't even take with us. What's the solution? What's the solution to this? Number three, Jesus gives us the solution to greed. Is it, is it to never buy anything on earth? Is it to, to give away everything? Is it to take a vow of poverty? Look where Jesus directs our obedience. Jesus ends with this concluding line that gives this alternative to a self-centered, earthly-centered lifestyle. Verse 21, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Rich toward God. What does this phrase mean? How, how can this be us? We want to be, we want to be like this. I think others have observed rightly that the verse is explained by contrasting it with the first half. Laying up treasures for yourself, one option. The opposite of that is being rich toward God. What would be the opposite of using your life to lay up more treasures for yourself? What would it look like in this world, this short life that you have on this earth, to do this? Let me take a suggestion. I'll just say it a couple of different ways. To be rich toward God is to spend in a way that shows it is more blessed to give than receive. To be rich toward God is to enjoy this world's feasts. Eat, drink, and be merry in a way that shows the real feast is yet to come. To be rich towards God is, as John Piper says, to enjoy his gifts in a way that shows he is more precious. To be rich toward God is to count what you have as his and a tool for making much of God. To be rich toward God is to give to his kingdom work so cheerfully, so regularly, so sacrificially, so worshipfully that you're just lost in the happiness of seeing God's name exalted in this world. So let me just offer just a few practical applications uh, to you as your pastor to help you think well about living this out. How can you be rich toward God? How can you avoid greed? Several, uh, just a few here. Number one, don't give until you find your treasure first in God. Don't give until you first find your treasure in God. You cannot give rightly until you first understand God as the giver. You cannot understand treasure rightly until you see God as your treasure. So if you're here today as a visitor, just very frankly, I'm not really wanting your money. I'm not looking for you to give. I, I, I am far more concerned that you hear that God and knowing him is the greatest treasure of our lives. That, that, that we, as human beings, we were created to know him, but, but we've rebelled against him. We've rejected him and rejected treasuring him as we ought. But the good news of the gospel is that even though we deserve death, Jesus gave up his heavenly riches, and he died in our place for our sin rose from the grave, so that Paul could write this in 1 Corinthians. He could say, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty we might become rich. If you would believe in Jesus Christ today and trust in him, if you would believe what scripture teaches about this world and this life and the life to come, then you can make Jesus Christ, not only your Savior from your sin and your Lord of your life, but the treasure of all your affections. Don't give until you figure this out first. Number two, I, let me recommend to you, find a local church and give primarily there. Now, it might be this church. It might be another healthy church. 
but you want to find a church you can trust and then become a member and give generously there. You want to give to a church where you see that the teaching of Scripture is just shaping the whole community. And then you want to invest sacrificially. God's plan for the expansion of his kingdom is so clearly in Scripture through local churches. Why wouldn't you want to invest chiefly and sacrificially in how God plans to work? A third point, just a piece of wisdom. Give and perhaps incrementally increase. And, you know, I know that some of you, beloved members here, are struggling to make ends meet, to provide for your family each month. And so for you to give 5% of your budget would just be a hard sacrifice. Well, let me encourage you, honor the Lord with what you can regularly, even if small. And some of you here, though, aren't struggling to pay the bills each month. And so for you, 20% of your income might be way too small of a gift. You need to think about giving sacrificially and not just passively. My encouragement is to grow in sacrificial giving so that you can increase it over the years, even incrementally. Number four, talk to others in your church about your finances and your heart toward money. Now this, I just think if you're just walking in here today and you're like a visitor, listening to what this guy up front is talking about, you might just think that just sounds like the craziest thing that you could say, especially in American culture. Like, finances are a private matter. We don't like to talk about finances. Just, I mean, just listen to me as a pastor in my counseling room. People will talk about all sorts of things to me, just very openly. Uh, but their readiness to talk about their finances, oh, it's like the last thing on the list. But what I'm recommending to you is if Jesus' warning here in verse 15 of this passage is true, if you need to take care to be on guard against covetousness, then why wouldn't you involve a few trusted friends in your church to help you think about how to do that in your life? I, I know it's hard to imagine, but just imagine thinking with close friends about whether you should take that that promotion at work or buy that new house or buy that second car to, to allow others to speak into how you're thinking about money and guarding your heart for what you can't see. That is how covetous you might be. Lastly, let me give a fifth point. What you do have, oh, let me encourage you, use it, enjoy it as a gift that God gives you. Not as an earthly hedonist. A hedonist is someone who prioritizes pleasure. Not as an earthly hedonist, but as an eternal hedonist. The rich man here was a fool for not thinking well enough about the future. For not admitting just the shortness of this life. So enjoy the gifts that God has given you. And share them. And worship with them in such a way that shows that you're looking forward to an eternal pleasure and treasure in Jesus Christ. Let me conclude today with a story. Uh, author Jamie Dunlop tells the story how in November of 2016, the government of India was facing significant financial corruption. And so they declared, get this, all 500 and 1,000 rupee banknotes to be null and void. I mean, just imagine here if the, the U.S. government just decided that the country will no longer use 10 and $20 bills, declaring that they're suddenly worthless. Well, to add to this chaos there in India in 2016, this action by the Indian government happened with just four hours' notice. I mean, overnight. Here is my question. What if you were living in India at that time? What would you do with all your 500 and 1,000 rupee notes after hearing that announcement? I'll tell you what you would do. You would move as quickly as you could to trade. You would trade the currency 
that is of passing value as fast as you could. You'd get it off your hands for a currency that would last because you believe what the government says. You believe that in just a short time, what you have is worthless. What a marvelous picture of Christian stewardship. This is Jesus' logical argument. He's saying, the announcement of this world has been made. In just a few short moments, your currency is of passing value. I mean, your life, your 60 years that you've got left, or whatever it is, is just a flash compared to the millions of years that you will spend in heaven. And Jesus says, the value of your currency, it's evaporating. So trade. I mean, why wouldn't you? Use everything you have to make yourself eternally rich toward God. To do anything less would be to either not believe that this is true or to listen to the empty promises of earthly greed. Let's be rich toward God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we glory in Jesus Christ who for our sake gave up riches to become poor for us. May we believe what your word says. May we take joy, <laughs> eternal joy, in being rich toward you. Give each of us, I pray, wisdom and discernment and a ruthless desire for obedience in how we do this. Give each of us uh, godly counselors in our church who can help us think about how we each should be rich toward God. May we grow in this, not for our glory, but for your glory, O oh God. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.